Many of you have uh, known about multiple hypothesis testing. Okay. Neither yes or no will not help me. I must have some uh, learning in the sense that some knowledge has to be transferred from you to me. Uh, are you familiar with multiple hypothesis testing simultaneously? How many of you have read the classic paper on this by uh, Hochberg and Benjamin. Benja Benjaminian Hochberg? First author is Benjamini. How many of you have read that article? Possibly not. Anyway, so, uh, if you go through multiple hypothesis testing, which is an area of great interest to those who deal with hypothesis testing or inference, there also we can make use of statistical transfer learning. In the sense that there we try to control what is typically called the false detection rate, right? False discovery rate. Uh, sorry, false discovery rate. Something akin to fault detection rate, anyway. This is FDR. Earlier they used to control what was called that family-wise error rate. But then it has been replaced by this uh, false discovery rate. In many experiments, where uh, several hypotheses have to be simultaneously tested to ultimately make either a false statement about something you have discovered, which should be avoided. At the same time, you don't want to really lose any information that you have gained from the different experiments and the corresponding hypothesis. So this is called FDR. As we try to, for example, in a single hypothesis testing, we try to control probability of type 2 error. Given the probability of type 1 error, we try to control probability of type 2 error, minimize that. Similarly, in the case of a large number of hypotheses to be tested simultaneously, we try to control this, what is called false discovery rate. And there also we can make use of statistical transfer learning. But unless you know something about this false discovery rate, it may not be making much sense to say how much the statistical transfer learning can help you there. You are familiar with uh, U sum charts, cumulative sub control charts, or the exponentially weighted moving average charts, EWMA. They are also, we try to use, as I said in multivariate data analysis. Same thing happens in cumulative sum control charts as also in the exponentially weighted moving average control charts, where you try to make use of some um, observed data up to a certain point of time in what you call training. It's not training in uh, deriving some parameters of the Q sum chart, which is usually done in terms of a V mask. There are two mask parameters which have to be found out, and this is done in terms of previous data which is akin to training data. And thereafter, the mask is used to uh, detect whether a point is really outside control or in control by gradually passing that V mask design. You are not familiar with the V mask? Are you familiar with control charts? Most of you are sure. Control charts they use parallel lines. Okay? There is a central line, an upper control limit, and a lower control limit. So if a point exceeds the upper control limit or goes below the lower control limit, you say there is something wrong, you stop the production process and hunt for assignable causes. Uh, if I go by cumulative sums, cumulative sums are not independent of each other, unlike IID setup for this particular control chart. Take, for instance, x bar. See, if I go on cumulating, cumulative sums are not no longer independent. They are not in the IID setup. There, the control chart is not operated in terms of parallel straight lines. It's in terms of a pair of reversed sequential probability ratio tests. You are familiar with SPRT, sequential probability ratio test, introduced by World. You take two such tests, reverse them, and then get what a pattern a pattern which will be shown like a V. 
Right? This is the last plotted point. This is the last plotted point. Some distance ahead will be the vertex of that V mask. A mask means a mukhosh, something that people sometimes wear. This is the mask. This you can prepare out of paper or out of tin or some metal. This is the last plotted point. There is a specified distance which will depend on the parameters of the SPRT. And then this is the V. This is the V. All points, all points which are covered by the V, earlier points which are covered by the V, indicate lack of control. And you can gradually shift the, the pattern, the V, to the right. Take it to the next last point, take it to the next last point, and so on. That's how a cumulative sum control chart on the basis of the SPRT operates. And no parallel control lines, but this V mask will be there. And there also, instead of the initial training set to determine the distance of the last plotted point to the vertex and the half angle between the two arms of the mask. This will be V. So there is an angle between the two arms of the V, the half angle and the distance of the last plotted point and the vertex. These are the two parameters of the cumulative sum control charts. Their estimates can also be obtained from some training data set. Improved estimates for further use can be obtained if you make use of statistical transfer learning. So that way, statistical transfer learning has become a very important tool to augment the currently available data set to you in terms of knowledge available from previous data sets or from other data sets as well. In this case, it was previous data set, but you could take advantage of other source data sets as well. And uh, the theory is not very, very complicated. The concept is important. And the, the uh, computational and other modeling aspects would depend on the models that you are using for the tasks that you are to carry out in the target domain. If it is a prediction model, it will be one type of situation. If it is a regression model, something different. So depending on the task in the target domain that you are interested in, you will take a model. That could be simple, that could be complicated. But then you are trying to get improved estimates of parameters in that model by augmenting the target data set in terms of other source data sets. Uh, the examples can't be discussed unless you have got knowledge in those areas. <clears throat> if you have any uh, questions about what I have said already, about the broad outline, the glimpse of it, you please feel free. Has something gone into your brains? Some idea at least. Yes, please. It seems to me that there is a very... A bit loudly. It seems to me that there is a nice connection between transfer learning and uh, spatiotemporal data analysis, like where you actually try to use information from nearby spatial domains and then try to uh, do some kind of an estimation or inference on the given spatial domain. So you are, you, you are using information from your nearby domains and then trying to use that information to come up with maybe improved estimation of exactly. one particular domain. It seems that to me that there is a nice connection between these two things. Am I correct in my... Sure. No, no. There is definitely a connection. The only point is about the methodology. And firstly, there need not be neighboring. I was trying to illustrate. Uh, they need not be neighboring at all. Landslides, I was talking of neighboring stations, or the urban rapid transport system, I talked of neighboring stations. The point of neighboring doesn't really arise. This is number one. <clears throat> number two, uh, and the question is of definitely making estimates of parameters, and based on those, tests of hypothesis, like in the multiple hypothesis testing procedures making use of covariates and all those. <clears throat> the approach is, there could be different approaches. One could be through the Bayesian approach, where I'm not directly taking into account the data sets uh, in the neighboring or distant uh, previous cases, or what you call source domains. But in terms of a common prior assumed, right, for the similar type of parameters involved, 
in individual models which can be set up for the different locations or for the different uh, source <coughs> domain. So that way the approach is slightly different from what you said. Otherwise, there is a lot of uh, keenness or there is a lot of similarity between these two. Sure. Some of you should raise even innocent questions. That will be interesting to me. Just raise some questions or the other. How do you select the data? Huh? How do you select the data? I, I guess it depends on the problem you are working on. You said the whole data. You cannot take all of them. All of them. Uh, again, the point old may not be really old in time, but they could be. They could be previous learning in terms of old data already analyzed to give you some knowledge. In the sense that you have already parameters estimated there, some hypothesis tested, this also could be in terms of knowledge that you have gained. And you want to take advantage of that knowledge. In the sense that you are not directly combining the data. Remember, there is a term called metadata. I'm not talking of metadata. I'm not pulling data sets, number one. There is another term called meta-analysis, where already on different data sets, I've carried out different analysis of the same time. I've carried out an over here, an over here, could be man over here, man over here, man over there. The findings I can combine, that's meta-analysis. This is not metadata, not meta-analysis. Directly, I'm not taking into account the old data, although I'm talking of uh, augmenting the, the target data set by the old data set, this augmentation is somewhat remote. It's not in terms of pulling the data. It's not in terms of even pulling results of previous inferences. But in terms of, as I was trying to explain, assuming, for example, a common prior distribution, right, for similar parameters, parameters of the same type, not the same parameters maybe, which have been already estimated in the other source domains. So you have to keep in mind terms like metadata, meta-analysis, which are different from this uh, statistical transfer learning. Uh, have I responded to your question, really? I, mean, I hope that you're not directly using the conclusion. Uh, old data are not, simply, uh, are not simply pulled along with the new data for the target domain. Results of the old data sets in terms of some analysis carried out are not simply borrowed to enrich or improve estimates of your target data set. But the target data set, assuming a certain joint distribution, has to be somehow related to the joint distributions there. If they're completely unrelated, you cannot take advantage. You cannot transfer that knowledge to this, right? Uh, Sanskrit grammar knowledge will not help you to understand English grammar. But, but then French and uh, German grammar can be easily done. I know a little bit of French grammar, and I know a lot more of Sanskrit grammar. Still today, you can ask me something of Sanskrit grammar. I can answer your questions. I'm fond of that subject. But then I'm telling that uh, whatever knowledge has been achieved there, maybe in terms of uh, some hypothesis ultimately rejected, uh, some estimates going very awry, I mean odd, even that knowledge can help you to choose a, a better posterior for the data that you already obtained in the target domain. We noted that the one, one important approach used in statistical transfer learning was to derive your uh, posterior for the data set that you have got, not in terms of any assumed prior, generally that we do, independently of the other source domains, but illustrating in terms of one more source domain, making that prior dependent on the data there. We had uh, Yes, yes, yes. So this D0 has been already made use of. So the way we use the data in the other uh, source domain, that's important. We are not pooling. We are not simply combining results of analysis. That's meta-analysis. So this is neither metadata nor meta-analysis. Good. Uh. Pardon? Uh, you have defined the posterior to the board. Actually, help me. Keep watching. Sir, the posterior you have defined that way, 
it is not defined by the Bayesian techniques. And then uh, you could have defined uh, um, by taking D1 or D0 simultaneously. Means it is uh, it is a one form. Means we can define it other ways. You are saying this, this is the something power method. You can. Firstly, this is but, not unique. Uh, but in that case, that will give more accurate because in the in this case you are looking separately and D1 and D0 in the posterior form. Remember, remember this important point. We are assuming a prior for the target domain mm. ahead of getting the data for the target domain. Am I, am I, yeah. am I through? <coughs> I'm assuming a prior even before I've collected data for the target domain, but data are available already for the source domain. That's why this form. Okay. That, then it should be depend, means independent term. That you can see. Sir. These are nice questions, I enjoy. Sir, one more question, you are saying uh, the machine learning focus on only one learning. But recent development in computer vision and natural language processing using these techniques. I simply modified my statement saying traditionally machine learning does this. Yeah. There have been many modifications of machine learning and I do not know much about that. I should admit my ignorance. But classically or traditionally machine learning handles one task for one domain. That domain could have been in terms of merging all the domains that I am talking of. But in that case, I lose information about possible differences among the domains, which I don't like to. I would like to retain the distinctiveness of the different domains, calling the target, the different sources, and so on. Yeah. Yes, sir. sir, the transfer learning is also used in machine learning. But uh, the statistical part, you are using statistical transfer learning. That I'm not getting. It means I have read uh, the transfer learning in computer vision or uh, natural language processing. Uh, they are using the same techniques. Means uh, you are defining here uh, prior and posterior. They are doing it by first training the model on the on your target uh, source data set, and then training again on the target data set. That source is a part of the original domain. Yeah. To the extent I know, mm -hmm. in machine learning, the the first part or other. The, the source you are saying, that source is a part of the target source itself, which you call the training data set. Training data is nothing comparable to this. Training data is a part of the data corresponding to the target domain only. Yeah, yeah. Whereas here you have got multiple domains. Yeah, it is, yeah, okay. It's also if, I may, if I may comment on one thing that you said. Huh? Yeah. Huh? have data, I mean, if, if, if the D0 and D1 are, are indeed coming from different distributions, or maybe they differ in time, or they have different features. They could, they could differ in terms of three things we wrote. You remember? We had, they could differ in terms of time, instance of time, I said, features, or even the variables involved, and the distribution parameters. They could differ. They could differ. So in that case, if we do not do things in this way, and if we just proceed by pooling the data, then we are actually making or actually constructing some kind of a mixture distribution. There. Right. And confounding all of the parameters that. And you are not being able to retain, to give me ideas separately or distinctiveness among the among the stations, for example, or among the domains, that the domains are distinct in terms of instance of time, features, and distribution, at least distribution parameters that information will be lost if I merge them. So I don't talk of metadata. It's not metadata. Really good. Any other question? Yes, please. In terms of Using the, see the powers of the individual tests differ. That knowledge you are not making use of in controlling FDR in the usual procedures. That you can done. That you got done. Yes, please. He had a question. Sir, I have one question. Is this model is coming from some macroeconomic setup? Like in macroeconomics, also we have one model, and that model depends on whole lots of things. Like suppose price of oil drops here in India. That depends on some U.S. policy, Japan, stock exchange, and all other stuff. So it is like that, that this is a superset of all other models. 
like suppose we are using machine learning, support vector machine and all. So whatever development will happen in machine learning setup, then our this model will improve. If we assume really that uh, what happens in the uh, macroeconomic scale in one country affects economic development in some other countries as it is true, yeah. then definitely we can take advantage of this. So like you gave one example that uh, in metro station we are trying to predict some, you know, how much crowd will be there in tomorrow. Right. So that depends on nearby metro stations and that may depend on oh, some... Metro, I thought macroeconomics you're talking. Yes, no, sir. on that time I said about macroeconomics only. Now I am, you know, augmenting that example. Or macroeconomic growth, for example. Economic growth, that means macroeconomic growth in one country nowadays depends on the growth patterns of other countries as well. They are so, interlinked. So that way, if the growth is uh, comprehended in terms of multiple uh, vector, multiple mm -hmm. dimensions, having a joint distribution, different countries have got different distributions. But then there will be some common features and some relatedness structure can be obtained in terms of interdependence among the economies of different countries. If two countries are completely independent of one, each other in terms of their economic activities, then does, it doesn't benefit us. Otherwise, it may benefit us. All this I learned, I will tell you how. I was going through the proceedings of the last, uh, uh, con it's, a, it's a conference, no doubt. Some of you are familiar with the name of Box and Hunter. Uh, Stuart Hunter of the University of Madison passed away a few years back. And uh, there is an annual international uh, Stu Hunter, they call it Stu Hunter Memorial Research Conference. It's an international conference of 40, 50 people only, nothing beyond that, held annually in some part of Europe, but it's international, and it's called a research conference, in which there will be six or seven topics. They identify those main speakers, and on each uh, topic, there will be several discussions. So in what, maybe 2016 or 2017, the John Stewart Hunter Memorial Research Conference had one of the topics which was uh, statistical transfer learning. So I was immediately attracted and went through that. But I'm still studying many aspects of it. There is one more paper there. Uh, how do parliaments function in different countries? That was a research paper and there are many discussions on that. How do parliaments function? Anyway, these are instances of topics which are being taken up by statisticians these days. Hunter uh, had many joint uh, contributions with GEP Box. Box Hunter has got many, many research contributions. Okay, thank you all.